All right, in the last video, we talked about the nucleotide and how the nucleotides come together to produce a nucleic acid. Um, but we can't really finish our discussion of the structure of DNA without talking about how the DNA actually supercoils itself once the molecule has been produced. And so that's what we're going to spend some time talking about. In this picture, you can see the, and we haven't talked about them yet, but you can see histone proteins. You can also see the actual DNA. Uh, and so, like I said, we need to spend some time talking about how the molecule structures itself to fit not only within the nucleus, but within uh, the nucleolus, which is even smaller than the nucleus in eukaryotic cells. So how do DNA molecules package all of the DNA inside of a nucleus? Uh, and the answer is nucleosomes. What are nucleosomes? Nucleosomes are an octamer. And what does octamer mean? It means eight of something. Okay, in this case we have eight histone proteins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight histone proteins. Histones are proteins that act like a spool that we're going to spool our DNA around. And so uh, much like yarn or fishing line is spooled around or thread is spooled around a spool, uh, DNA, which is this red structure here, is spooled around this nucleosome, okay, or this octamer of histones uh, twice. We've got one, two wraps or two loops of our DNA around every single one of these uh, histone octamers. And this entire thing, two wraps of our DNA around an octamer of histones, produces a nucleosome structure, okay, nucleosome. What is a nucleosome? Um, it is just that. It's a spool that our DNA has employed to package our DNA molecules uh, to fit tighter into a more confined space. And it allows our DNA to stay safer uh, because there are a lot of enzymes that would like to and will readily rip a DNA molecule apart uh, and we don't want that. Okay, so we want to not only keep our DNA confined in a, in a usable, a neat, organized fashion, but we also want to keep it safe from a lot of the enzymes that are in the, the nucleus or within the cytoplasm of a cell. Okay, um, one of the, one of the most important parts of this discussion is that DNA itself has a negative charge and histone or proteins have uh, a positive charge and so if you have all of these positive charges in this octamer um, and have this negative charge around it it's going to produce kind of this um, attraction if you will and so it, it's what keeps the DNA actually confined to the spool itself and it doesn't allow the DNA to really start separating itself from the proteins. It allows the proteins and the DNA to, to remain tight and it, it really employs a really nicely organized way of, of storing the DNA. If we zoom out a little further um, and again we can we can start a discussion of the DNA double helix. This over here on the left side is the DNA double helix. We've talked about having our A pairs with T, C pairs with G, T pairs with A and so on and so forth and so we've got all of our nucleotides uh, utilized in a complementary strand okay we call this double strand or this complementary strand of DNA um, anti-parallel we also use the term double helix and what that means is that we have DNA running in a five prime to three prime direction in one strand and we have a five prime to three prime direction on the other strand. Those two strands, notice, are running in opposite ways. And so just like in the last video, we talked about this idea of anti-parallel. And so I'll put it again, anti-parallel, double helix. Remember, we have hydrogen bonds that are holding these two complementary uh, nucleotides or the complementary nitrogenous bases together. We have our phosphodiester bonds or our covalent bonds holding the backbones together and that helps to produce a really nice uh, molecule but now how do we package the molecule? We're going to take this DNA we're going to wrap it around histone proteins. Remember the histone proteins are positive DNA is negative and when we take eight of these histone proteins and package it into this octamer we're going to produce these little octamer um, double coils, if you will, these little packaging units. Each one of these are nucleosomes, 
Okay, nucleosomes. Those nucleosomes are 10 nanometers in diameter. Not something you necessarily need to know, but just notice that um, when you look at DNA, a lot of times when you look at kind of the, the, the less than supercoiled version, which you can see here, it often looks like beads on a string. And so a lot of times you'll see DNA and what looks like a beaded necklace. That the beads that you're looking at are the nucleosomes. And each one of these nucleosomes have two wraps of DNA around them. Um, but then we even, we even more tightly package the DNA. And we take these nucleosomes and we supercoil it into this really nicely packed coil that we then coil again. And uh, by the time it's over, we have actually wrapped the DNA a total of four times. Okay, four times we're going to wrap the DNA because we've essentially twisted it for the first time here. We've wrapped them twice around our histone octets. Uh, we've coiled it here for a third time and then we've twisted this up for a fourth time. Okay, fourth time uh, before we actually put them into these famous X-shaped structures known as chromosomes. And we're going to have a lot more discussion of chromosomes later when we get into genetics, but for now, um, I think everybody kind of knows what this famous X-shaped structure of DNA is called. It's called a chromosome. Uh, but this is how we get from our DNA double helix all the way to what is essentially our our DNA version that will go through uh, not only chromosomal separation uh, when we talk about mitosis and meiosis, but also division of the cell. Um, what are the benefits of DNA packaging? Because the cell obviously has to benefit from it or it wouldn't do it. Uh, the main benefit is size. Okay, so we talk about benefit number one is all about size. The nucleus is really, really small. Okay, uh, we can't even see cells with the naked eye yet all the DNA that fits into a single chromosome can be four centimeters long. And if you were to take all the DNA in every cell of your body and put it end to end, because we have again 46 chromosomes, that DNA would actually be about two meters in length. So how do you fit a molecule that is two meters into a nucleus of a cell that you can't see with the naked eye? Um, and the answer to that is you have to supercoil it. Again, you coil it or, or um, twist it once, twice, three times, four times, and now we are packaging it in, um, into chromosomes. Um, but if size, which is our number one, isn't the only benefit, then we have number two. And the second benefit is safety. We want to keep our DNA molecule incredibly safe because we have enzymes in our nucleus and within the cytoplasm of every cell. And these enzymes not only can uh, destroy the DNA molecule, but could uh, really produce a lot of devastating effects when we start talking about mutations and what some of those mutations can mean to the safety of the organism. Um, and so, again, size, safety, we need to maintain uh, kind of some structural integrity this member or into this molecule, and we want to always ensure that it is not only fitting in the cell, but it is also safe to a lot of the transcription enzymes um, that, that are obviously there and can uh, do devastating things to it. All right, and so now that we know how the DNA actually structures itself, how it packages itself, we need to talk about um, what the specific sequences of DNA can actually code for. And uh, surprising, most of and the vast majority of your DNA doesn't actually code for proteins, meaning it doesn't actually make necessarily you, you. Um, you are a, a, a bunch of genes, okay? And your, your DNA contains a bunch of genes, and your genes code for specific proteins, and those proteins, um, once phenotypically expressed, make you you. Uh, but a lot of the DNA that we have in our, our cells are actually just kind of an ancestral DNA or um, they are repeated sequences of DNA or they are structural DNA or they are telomeres on the end of our chromosomes or they are uh, coding regions or they're uh, regulatory regions. These regions don't actually code for proteins and thus or, or therefore don't actually make you 
um, unique in, in a sense that we think of. But they're still there and they're still important to note. They're still important to talk about. And so 2% of uh, the human genome or the human DNA actually codes for proteins, meaning um, these are the proteins that are actually going to be expressed um, as our, essentially our phenotype. And all the other DNA that doesn't code for the proteins that are essential to making us us it can be seen in this chart. And so we've got uh, most of it, if you notice, 45% or about 50% of our DNA come into play in, in the form of repetitive sequences. And these repetitive sequences are or as or just what they sound like. They're repetitive sequences or they're sequences that are repeated over and over and over. And so you might see a T-A-C-C-T-A -C -C -A, um, repeated and have T-A-C-C-T-A, T-A-C-C-T-A, -C -C so on and so forth. And you just have it over and over and over and they can be up to like 300 repeats long. Um, they're essentially just um, unnecessary DNA used to be called, or I've heard some people say junk DNA. Uh, there, It's not junk DNA. Obviously, it's DNA that is in your genome, but um, it's unnecessary DNA in the form of, of these repetitive sequences. Introns, about a quarter of your DNA are in the form of introns. Uh, it's not as important for you to know what introns and exons are at this point because we haven't really talked about RNA processing, and we will when we get into transcription and uh, the further mechanisms of protein synthesis. But exons are what are eventually going to be expressed as protein. Um, as we can see in this diagram here, introns would be the sections that are kept in the nucleus and so therefore not going to be expressed. They're going to be the sections that are cut out of our, uh, essentially of our mRNA molecule and are not going to be expressed as our protein uh, and so therefore not going to be needed. Telomeres are the actual caps of our DNA molecules, and so they are structural. They are not needed uh, when we talk about like expressing uh, proteins or expressing genes as a protein, but they are really, really important. And so again, most of the DNA we have in our genome is not needed for actual protein synthesis, but it is vital in order for our um, cells to go through a lot of the cellular uh, interactions in the cellular processing that our cells go through. Um, it is important to note that this promoter sequence or this promoter region, like it says up here, regulators of gene expression, this is where RNA polymerase will actually bind to. Uh, and again, we'll get into that in a lot more detail when we talk about RNA processing and RNA transcription. So like I said before, the highly repetitive sequences are anything that is repeated over and over and over and over, and it doesn't actually pro, uh, doesn't actually code for a protein. It can be as many as 100,000 replicants, and each repetitive sequence can be between five and 300 base pairs. So, like I said before, you might see T A C C T A T, and that would be repeated over and over and over, um, up to 100,000 times. It is often referred to as satellite DNA. Sometimes, like I said before, called junk. DNA because before we really knew what it was, it was it was referred to as just junk. It didn't really have a function, and it and it still doesn't really have a function other than um, it helps to kind of beef up the genome. But again, it doesn't have any coding function. It's just there, but makes up about 50% of the human genome. Okay, so if we look at this repeating uh, this replicate, uh, T A C G T G. And we repeat it over and 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 over. That would be an example of a highly repetitive sequence. All of this doesn't actually have any coding function, but it's there and helps to, like I said, beef up the genome and protect this uh, in green, which might actually be a coding uh, genome or a coding gene, the start of a gene. Okay. Now, another type of replicate is a short tandem repeats. This is a little different than um, the, the bulk kind of repeat that we talked about before, um, but there's two different things on this slide. There's short tandem repeats, sometimes just STRs, and then we have single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are SNPs. So we've got STRs, 
and SMPs. Both of them are really important. Short tandem repeats um, can be seen here in these yellow boxes. Man 1, 2, and 3 are, let's say, um, different men of interest in a particular uh, case. Maybe it's a forensic file type case um, where they're potentially looking at um, who the father is um, or who left a particular piece of evidence behind. But we've got in Man 1, 5 repeats, in Man 2, 6 repeats, and in Man 3, 7 repeats of this CTA uh, short tandem repeat. Okay, uh, the short tandem repeats can be usually anywhere between two and five base pairs. In this case, it is three. You have a CTA, which is a short tandem repeat. This is not always the only short tandem repeat you will see. Like I said, sometimes it can be up to five. Sometimes it can be as little as two. But we've got one, two, three, four, five repeats. Like I said, five repeats in man one, six repeats in, in man two, and seven repeats in man three. But most important thing to note about all three of these men's sequences is that every single sequence is identical other than the number of repeats okay so number of repeats and this SNP okay the SNP the single nucleotide polymorphism this is regions of significant variation when we look at uh, genomes and we look at different men or different women in terms of forensic uh, science or anything like that they always isolate or try to isolate the single nucleotide polymorphisms because out of an entire uh, section of DNA, we may have only one particular difference in an entire gene even. Uh, and so we refer to these as single nucleotide polymorphisms. In this case, man 1 has a T, man 2 and 3 both have an A. If the DNA sample contained a T in this location, you could rule out man 1 and man 3. Um, and focus your efforts on man 1 as he would be a lot more likely to be a suspect um, if, for instance, that single nucleotide polymorphism um, met or um, resembled the sample. Okay, um, so like I said, single nucleotide polymorphisms can be a significant difference or a significant variation within a gene. Um, if this is a normal gene, notice that they're all gray. Um, and in this case, they've been changed a different color, but notice that we have a red uh, nucleotide or a single nucleotide polymorphism. Maybe this is um, an A instead of a C, okay? That A might be the, the, the difference needed to alter this enzyme. And remember, we've talked about enzymes before. We know that this enzyme or any enzyme has a particular active site which has to be a particular shape in order to accommodate a particular substrate. And if you change, in this case, one, even one nucleotide, the C to an A, you can alter the shape of this active site and thus alter the function of the enzyme. A, an enzyme with an active site that is shaped this way is not going to function the same way that an enzyme with this shaped active site is going to function because, like I've said before, structure dictates function. Okay, and enzymes are a perfect example of that. Structure dictates function. But enzymes are proteins. Proteins are coded for by genes. Genes are sections of DNA. And so DNA has to code for a particular gene that codes for a particular enzyme uh, that has to function or has to be structured the correct way to function the correct way. Um, and so, like I said, single nucleotide polymorphisms are a, a really, really important component of DNA, especially when we talk about um, diversity. And so leading to diversity among all humans or leading to diversity among all rats or all starfish or all jellyfish or whatever you're talking about, um, it's the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are key to increasing diversity because, like I said, only two or about two percent of an entire genome is what actually leads to protein synthesis uh, and so these single nucleotide polymorphisms make up the two percent um, or make up a large portion of that two percent okay now if we keep going into our non-coding dna sections um, one of the biggest components remember it was about 25 percent about 
about a quarter of your DNA makes up the structural DNA. And telomeres are kind of the main component of the structural DNA. The telomeres can be seen as protective caps at the ends of every chromosome. Um, we know that chromosomes resemble this X-shaped, um, and on the ends of every chromosome are these caps, and these caps are going to serve an incredibly important um, function. Just like, and this is an analogy, but just like the protective caps on the ends of a shoelace help protect the shoelace from unraveling, um, the caps on, or the telomeres, the caps on the chromosomes are going to not only help the chromosome DNA from unraveling, but it's also going to help put a protective layer or a protective covering like a helmet on this chromosome in order to keep the enzymes which are out here and ready to actually digest or actually um, tear down the DNA. It's going to help them uh, withstand the damage associated with those enzymes. Okay, So uh, inside a cell, all of these chromosomes, notice that they are green or blue and they all have these little red protective caps. These caps are called telomeres and those telomeres are essentially just DNA like our chromosome DNA but these are non-coding DNA and that non-coding DNA is structural and it's like I said it's non-coding so it's not going to produce protein but it's there to help withstand the, um, the, the digestion that can happen from these enzymes um, but it's also important to note that telomeres actually get shorter each time a cell copies itself and that again is just to um, make sure the DNA that is important and I'll say this is the important DNA it's from cap to cap um, that's the important DNA if this was a helmet let's just say that I'm incredibly clumsy and I wear a helmet when I like ride a bike and every time I fall which happens frequently I skin a little bit of this helmet off or I dent the helmet in a little bit every time I fall I'm making the helmet um, less and less effective well every time these chromosomes divide this cap is getting less and less thick it's getting uh, less and less effective and so the telomere actually gets shorter every time the chromosome divides um, which I'll talk to, uh, which obviously have some total repercussions or some severe repercussions when we talk about aging and the onset of diseases. Okay, um, so what are the the repercussions of telomere shortening? Well, these are things that actually can impact the uh, the thickness of a telomere: obesity, uh, stress, both psychologically and oxidatively. UV radiation, or radiation, smoking, pollution, toxins, and disease. All of these things are going to decrease the thickness of the telomeres. And so you can see it here. Telomere shortening. It happens all the time. You cannot avoid it. It happens all the time. Um, every time a cell divides, then these telomeres are going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually, the uh, telomere gets so short that cell division itself actually stops. This is one of the main reasons why a lot of uh, researchers right now are trying to put or trying to correlate telomere shortening to the onset of disease, cancer, as well as dementia, Alzheimer's, but also death. Okay, There's a reason why um, death happens. Cell division stops, and if cell division stops, um, that probably plays a pretty good role in uh, not only aging, but the onset of disease. Some things that can actually slow telomere shortening, uh, things that you need to keep in mind, eating a healthy diet, um, wearing sunscreen so that this UV radiation doesn't actually impact uh, or get to the level of your cell that has uh, the DNA. Exercise, happy, and um, happy is, is one that we all need to think about. Um, just be a happy person and your telomeres will thank you. Okay. Research supports the correlation between telomere length and the process of aging and onset of cancer. Like I said, really, really important. Take care of your telomeres and your telomeres will take care of you. 
Don't forget about RNA. So we've talked about, or in length in both videos, DNA structure as well as DNA packaging and nucleotide um, and how nucleotides uh, come together to produce a nucleic acid. But we don't want to forget about RNA. RNA is a nucleotide or a nucleic, nucleic acid too. Um, DNA and RNA have some very uh, significant correlations. They're made of a lot of things that are similar. They look similar, but they are also made of things or are structured very different. Notice that DNA is composed of adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Thymine being the one that is different. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil. So thymine um, and uracil are the same or take up the same place. Okay, thymine, remember, in DNA pairs with T. Over here, adenine is going to pair with uracil. So uracil takes the place of thymine in RNA. RNA is also single-stranded. It's made up of the sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose, and it contains uracil instead of uh, thymine. RNA can also leave the nucleus, whereas DNA needs to stay in the nucleus, and there are several types of RNA, including mRNA, T RNA R RNA. Okay. Uh, but we'll get into what RNA is in later videos, especially when we get into RNA transcription and RNA processing. Um, and we're going to end the video with a, a little discussion of one of these nature of science uh, talks that are so um, important in the IB syllabus. And that has to do with this idea of DNA models and how our understanding of modeling and our, our, um, the way in which we model can actually change over time. This was a very crude three-dimensional model that Watson and Crick came up with using a lot of the materials they had and a lot of the resources they had at the time. Um, but they noticed early on that there was a flaw associated with this early model, and that was that adenine and thymine were not a one-to-one. -one. We know now that A equals T and C equals G. Okay, that was, it's obviously one of Shargoff's rules. He's the one that came up with base pairing rules um, by looking at cell division and looking at how the A's and T's pair and how the C's and G's pair. Um, but we have learned that DNA must be a double helix um, after going through these models. And we learned that the bases and base pairing have a very definitive relationship. A pairs with T, C pairs with G. And we know or learned by looking at models that the strands have to be anti-parallel to allow a lot of that base pairing to happen. Um, but nature of science, it is really, really important that we know that uh, new models, new technologies, new ways of looking at things can actually come about. And now we have actual uh, really good 3D computer animations that allow us to look at a DNA molecule um, actually in motion. Um, which is something that Watson and Crick obviously didn't have when they were putting together this very crude. But, you know, between their time and now, we have seen a, a significant increase in how we model DNA, um, which is just like everything. Technology is inevitable. It's happening exponentially. We need to use it and embrace it in order to help understand our, our understanding of biology. Okay, that's where we're going to end it. We will see you next time. Bye.